few times over the last uh, five or six years. I think the last time that I was here, uh, it was the conclusion of a series uh, that was being organized by John Robinson, who was then in uh, uh, systems design. He's now in Memorial. And uh, uh, he and uh, Paul Beam had combined in what some regarded as this rather unnatural alliance between rhetoric and systems design and uh, went one step further once a year and invited m me and my department to come down and speak at a, uh, a program that they had pulled together that was uh, as a result of the merger of these two um, uh, faculties. So um, they kept asking us back, so um, we kept coming and always to this space. Um, Sanjay and Eduardo uh, joined me in a department which we call Distributed Learning and Performance Support at the Banks uh, Institute. I'll describe the institute a little later on. Uh, and we'll describe some of our approaches, uh, some of our products, some of our outcomes, as well as some of our culture. Um, our understanding from uh, Shirley and from Don is that the uh, audience that we could expect today had a sprinkling of individuals uh, interested in education, in management, and in technology. So we're going to keep the, uh, uh, the topic fairly fluid and fairly uh, uh, broad, and we'll uh, invite questions from you uh, at the conclusion along any of those aspects around process or technology or people or education, however uh, you wish. Um, primarily and uh, empathetically, um, my opening words, which are designed to, uh, I guess, frame uh, this session, um, are to uh, fellow managers uh, within the very rapidly changing world of the knowledge economy. However, my uh, words uh, uh, could well equally apply to any of you for whom the, the following quote has meaning. Um, we have our own version of, uh, of Andretti's quote. And uh, this was overheard in uh, our new virtual banking enterprise uh, uh, called MBanks. In MBanks, if you're comfortable, you're late. Uh, it's within this milieu, it's within this uh, uh, environment that much of what we want to talk about today is situated. Uh, let me, however, first situate Bank of Montreal for you. Uh, um, assets of 208 billion, um, market capitalization, which is the way in which all banks these days are being uh, uh, sized and judged against their peers, of uh, approximately 20 plus uh, billion dollars. To give you a sense of what that means, um, uh, uh, if the merger with Royal proceeds, then the combined market capitalization of Bank of Montreal and Royal Bank would still put us, I think, at 24th in the world. Uh, 35,000 plus employees, um, primarily through North America, and as far as our business is concerned, an annual training budget in excess of $60 million. And the Bank of Montreal family of companies, um, uh, 1,100 Canadian branches in five time zones. Uh, in Harris Bank, centered in Chicago, another 140 uh, locations uh, in the U.S. Midwest. Um, uh, the uh, leading investment bank in, uh, in Canada, Nesbitt Burns, a MasterCard operation, a global uh, treasury group um, yeah, throughout uh, North America, Singapore, Seoul, London, and the like. Um, uh, recently acquired uh, more than 20% interest in Banco Mer, the second largest financial services firm in Mexico. And uh, in October 96, and the basis for the framing of some of the environment I want to talk about, um, the launch of MBanks, uh, which at its time was the first fully virtual banking enterprise in North America. For the uh, better part of the last decade, 
Uh, the Bank of Montreal has wrestled with the need to become ever more responsive to competitive changes. Uh, with uh, the 34,000, 35,000 employees uh, scattered across Canada and around the world, our ability to recognize developments in the marketplace and respond to them in a timely and appropriate way remained a, a constant contest. So in uh, 96, uh, Bank of Montreal was preparing to meet those challenges posed by internet banking, strategists having long pointed to the development of communications technology and the influence that it would undoubtedly have on financial services. And the reason that we're here today is that uh, most of you are concentrating undoubtedly on those types of developments in your very capacities. So in, in June of 96, a project was commenced that signified an approach to communications technology that was decidedly different within Bank of Montreal. While we had heavily invested in technology in the past, those new technological services had been designed to complement the uh, existing branch network. Uh, the new project promised to lay a new foundation to provide anywhere, anytime, any way banking through the internet and personal computer, through the internet and personal computer, by telephone, by fax, by mail, M banks, as it would eventually be known, would essentially be branchless banking. Uh, the project was to be piloted in Calgary uh, in mid-October of 96 and, and potentially launched nationally six months later. However, the, uh, the senior executives went ahead and approved the value proposition underlying M banks in early September of that year. However, they felt that our emphasis on responding to competitive challenges uh, was robbing us of the ability to launch competitive challenges. Uh, endless pilots were depriving us of the opportunity to take the competition by surprise. So spurred on by rumors uh, that competitors, large and small, domestic and international, were moving towards the same type of launch, they determined to preempt the competition. The pilot would not go ahead. Instead, M banks would be implemented nationally in the same six week time frame. With 10 weeks of the project already complete and with six weeks to launch, the challenge was enormous. Build a bank in four months. It was into this uh, midst of uh, this total absence of the established norms and the typical rules of our business that a team of us from the Institute uh, for Learning was invited. Uh, but it's also where we've stayed and where we've thrived among other parts of the business of the Bank of Montreal. Uh, M Banks itself has uh, flourished. Uh, it's grown from zero staff then in October 96 to some 500, uh, 650 staff right now. And that's in about 60 months. And that's now been joined by a new sister organization um, in M Banks US. There are uh, three uh, key areas of challenge for us, which were represented to us and came home to roost in the launch of M banks. Um, and our reflective, I believe, increasingly, and we've discovered increasingly, of, of everywhere we're working within the bank. And as I talk to other colleagues in our line of business elsewhere within uh, North America and increasingly in Europe, dramatically shortened lead times and narrow windows of opportunity to design and develop enough training and performance support solutions. Second challenge, the learners demand for just enough training just when they need it. And the third challenge, the need to capture the experience in this environment of rapid change, to learn from our mistakes and successes and to make them part 
of organizational memory. We coined a term at that time to describe the environment that we're in, and I've headed up this slide with it. The nanosecond development environment. Uh, it's an environment we had expected, we just didn't know when it was going to arrive. However, being prepared for the changing demands of business, as well as shaping demand for what we have to offer or will offer, are key roles for us at the uh, Institute for Learning. I know that uh, there are some colleagues in the audience here who've had the opportunity over the last three years to come and visit us at the Institute. Uh, part of our mandate um, there is to facilitate learning for the bank's employees and to help generate and sustain a culture within the organization that prizes lifelong learning and focuses on inspiring exceptional performance. The uh, Institute, as a result, I believe, has occupied a position at the vanguard of Bank of Montreal's quest for innovation. Besides accommodating about 250 students uh, every day from Bank of Montreal, the Institute also houses a design and development partnership between classroom and open learning. Uh, the latter half of the partnership, the open learning component, is the one that I manage. And the distinction that we have there in, uh, in the development focus is a reflection of the shift that we've experienced in the way in which learning is accessed and delivered. Um, when I first arrived with, at the then training department of the bank, the focus was primarily around classroom experience, with some 70% of the uh, time uh, based on, or the time uh, uh, of learning being classroom based. And that has, over the following seven years, completely uh, turned around. So now it's actually very close to 80% of our learning is in fact distributed, uh, primarily workplace-based. Um, we uh, offer in the, uh, from the Institute a whole suite of open learning solutions, um, all of which are being used or are planned for use within not only the MBANKS organization, but every part of the organization that we're working with. Um, uh, for those of you who have um, a particular interest in the um, uh, learning side of the equation, um, we've based much of our efforts upon some key elements of uh, our open learning strategy. Um, <clears throat> we have a primary focus on improving human performance. Uh, it was an intensity of belief that a training organization is an organization that is based on input rather than output. And that a performance organization is an organization that's focused on added value and output. That lies at the heart of our open learning strategy. Much more keenly interested in the end goal of performance than in one single input of training. We're in the business of the recognition of and resolution of pain and the, uh, the, the, the uh, success of the range of aspirations that are uh, put in front of us. We have a focus both on efficiency and effectiveness from the perspective of the business unit. And for the learner within the unit, the currency and the relevance of the materials that are going to be at their fingertips. In order to achieve our approach and our goals, uh, we were not going to be in a position of uh, uh, simply accepting what was going to be presented to us, but rather we saw ourselves as being a client of the organization, uh, a group that wanted to in fact drive how the organization designed its 
infrastructures to allow learning to occur. Um, that's a bit of a backwards approach to the traditional approaches of training organizations, uh, but it's been uh, of all approaches, of all elements of our strategy, probably the one that has had the greatest ultimate potential benefit uh, to allowing us to achieve our goals. And so wherever we can, we put ourselves in a position, often completely and utterly shamelessly, of being at every table that we need to be, so that we can in fact influence the technological and organizational infrastructures of the organization for learning to be accessed. Um, to date, our progress in the uh, nanosecond development environment has been grounded in three basic uh, fields. In the reshaping of process, in the, uh, in the capitalization on emerging learning technologies, and in the uh, focus on a range of aspects of people and organization and culture in our development. I'm going to take about five minutes and just talk about the first in that list, the people, organization, and development. And that's my main goal as the manager of the unit. Eduardo will put his hand to a process and the rest and the majority of the uh, session um, will be uh, to Sanjay to not only talk about some of the places where we are influentially affecting technological infrastructure, but also to show and to demonstrate some of our um, uh, output and our products in uh, technology-based learning. Um, we have an organization in distributed learning and performance support, which is um, essentially based on um, uh, mitigated risk. We accept the fact that at any moment we're going to be out of business. And as a consequence, um, uh, we approach um, valuing that and not running away from that. It became part of our cultural definition to say that we did not want to be in the business of grant and aid. We did not want to be in the business of grace and favor. And therefore, we not only embraced notions of zero-based budgeting, which in a decade ago were being shied from by many within the staff support regions of businesses, but we took it and we built on it. As a consequence, we have an organization which at this moment is funded only to a very small degree by the institution in which we are based. Some 80% of our funding, both in terms of the resources that are part of our group as well as all other expenses, come directly from the projects that we successfully bid on within the organization. This is understanding, by the way, that that organization can, if it so chooses, go elsewhere. Our challenge is always to be able to provide a, a value-added and an efficient and an effective set of solutions that allow the organization to come to us. So we started with about six people seven years ago. We're now up to a department of about 60 to 70 individuals. Last year we put a throughput in terms of projects of $10 million and we're looking to do the same thing this year. Uh, in order to do that, we have to attract uh, individuals who are prepared to equally take risk um, uh, into an organization that respects them and respects and in fact encourages the ability to make mistakes, but to make mistakes loudly and quickly in a way that others can learn and others can come to the table to support. In many ways, some regard that these are elements of an heroic environment. They are elements which, base, which are based upon notions of uncompromising truth 
and upon the development of substantial layers of trust in looking for individuals to be part of this organization we look for some core attributes we're looking at individuals who are entrepreneurial in nature who have high capability in the interpersonal skills and who are very strong team players and we look at and build specific core skills project management design and analysis skills both in terms of instructional design and in visual design and in prototyping and also core skills in the areas of learning technologies people come to us from a wide variety of backgrounds um, the print journalist the print journalist who's been trained for years that she can never lose the lead the uh, occupational therapist who from years of dealing with profoundly disabled individuals understands the notion of performance like not many other people are able to do network technology specialists and so on and so forth and we also build or we've built access to a network of uh, independent contractors these are individuals who in our view share the values the type of approaches that we uh, believe in um, who cover the skill gaps that we haven't got or that we are choosing not to invest in and who are more than anything willing to share their learnings with us and we with them and are to, willing to debate us around those learnings as I mentioned we leverage project funding structures so that we approach the business from a very real perspective of direct pay and constant in our attention is the need to focus on systems structures and processes and their continuous need for attention uh, and improvement uh, organizationally we choose to be at the right table whether it's around enterprise network architecture or around application development or around new business processes and new organizations and networks are essential uh, research networks uh, one of my uh, good colleagues from the uh, telelearning network of centers of excellence Tom Carey and I have worked together in that network for some years Tom's just up here on the right uh, practitioner networks individuals who are engaged in uh, uh, stretching the edge as we hope we are in terms of some of the approaches that we are choosing to take and external validation and recognition to give not only a response to the constant internal challenges that we have in terms of, uh, of uh, funding and demand but to complement that with an understanding of what others our peers view as being quality uh, Sanjay will provide one example of that in uh, his session um, um, uh, three weeks ago we were honored to uh, win uh, one of the most prestigious awards in interactive multimedia in the training world um, the British Institute of um, uh, multimedia have a, a now in their 14th year of, of hard-fought annual competition and uh, our entry was the only Canadian entry to be shortlisted and we were gratified in fact to win so um, that's a bit about us and about our structure and about some of our culture and Eduardo will now take you through approaches that we have around process and then Sanjay around the technologies themselves um in the area of learning technologies, advanced learning technologies. I lead that group. Um, it's a smaller group within the larger distributed learning and performance support team. So now we've heard what Malcolm was saying in terms of our vision and where we wanted to go. But a vision is only as good as its implementation, as we all know. And here you go. And um, basically, if I think back, in terms of what we were doing four or five years ago, 
when I started there. We're doing mainly distribution of modules, paper-based modules to uh, our different branches, etc. And then with the technology revolution, it's been an exponential change for us. And we've had a heck of a time trying to stay on top of it and, and manage it. So we're not, I'm not here to tell you we have it all figured out. I'm not here to say this is the right way. This is just a slicing time for us. And what I want to show you is basically, basically an amalgamation of the process that we follow. It's not perfect. It looks perfect on paper. There are all kinds of barriers that we bump into. But it, it works for us. So without further ado, if I can get my, there we go. Okay. Basically, a bunch of things have happened. The, um, there is a technological change, but there's also what's happening with our clients. And also our clients are being affected by technological change. No longer can we afford, or can they afford to wait months and months for a learning solution until all the dots and T's are crossed. Sometimes, especially in the case of M-Banks, for instance, we had literally um, months to put together a whole learning strategy, two weeks, I think, in one case. So there is no way that traditional processes are gonna enable us to do that. So we had to basically scramble, look around, try to innovate, and trial and error. But we're always dealing with this triangle, and this triangle is time to market. We wanna shorten the time to market as much as possible. Decreasing unit cost, that's very important as well in our world, and also to sustain and improve quality. Um, we think of ourselves as a business, and we're not arrogant enough to think that our clients don't have the choice to go outside our organization and, and basically deal with um, vendors. So we also try to stay very much competitive vis-a-vis -vis the market, and that's something we take very seriously. And of course, quality. We're always aiming to sustain and improve quality, and really that's where we, we like to exist in that triangle. We also focus on the business processes because that's really what makes us relevant to our client. We take pride in trying to understand exactly what our clients do and understand their business as well as they do. Because that, in that way, and only that way, we can add value. I already mentioned about that. Content obsolescence is something we're running into. And um, particularly with fixed media like CD-ROMs, for instance, once it's pressed, the content is there. And so we have to be very careful in to, as to what we choose. Cost of ongoing changes as well. Um, so basically, we've taken an approach to instructional design and to everything we do. And we call it, it's not original, it's actually, and you'll see it's based on another work, we call it uh, successive approximations. We're moving from a craft approach to more of a mass marketing approach. Mass customization is something that I'm sure a lot of people have heard in this room, and we're starting to move in that direction. Uh, we do as much as possible parallel development. Uh, one thing to, to note that's important, everything we do is done in English and French as well. So that brings some interesting uh, complications when we're trying to develop um, learning. Because of our association with Bancomer, Spanish is in the horizon, and we also have some association with China, so Mandarin is also in the horizon. So we're trying to work on a model that will allow us to leverage and allow us to, to do that successfully. As I said, it's based on this layers of necessity instructional design model. I have a reference and I actually have a couple of articles in case anybody's interested after, afterwards. It's, um, it's basically, it deals with building the pieces that are of immediate need. So instead of trying to do everything, all the planning ahead of time, and as in the traditional models, we can enhance and add uh, pieces later. So this is a comparison between a traditional instructional design model and a successive approximation model. This is not to say, and I want to make this absolutely clear, that we're discounting the traditional ID model. If, even though on the surface it seems like a contradiction, it really isn't. Because you still need the, the rigor and the discipline to go through that process at a high level to understand exactly what you're dealing with. But it's when it comes to actually meeting the need of your client, which may be two weeks away, that yes, maybe a CD-ROM would be the best solution, but you know what, if it's only two weeks, maybe a storyboard on paper 
might be what's actually required to en enable them to get by long enough until we can deliver that CD-ROM for the longer term support of our employees. So as you can see, that's a more traditional model, the su successive approximation models. Basically, it's, it's a spiral. It's a spiral that says assess, design, develop, implement, assess again, and it continues on and on and on until we get it right. And in some ways, we never think we get it right. There's always room for improvement. Okay. <coughs> Why do we use this? Well, it avoids the analysis paralysis of basically taking so long to analyze a problem that in that time, the environment and circumstances change. So you end up with a whole new different spin and you have to go back to the beginning and start the analysis again. Um, it also moves the analysis into a real world concept. Our clients are not happy anymore just saying, okay, you go off in your own little corners and analyze and come back to us in a few months with a plan. That doesn't work anymore because their world doesn't work like that. It involves the client early and often and we found that's key. Um, allows the design team to use the prototypes to build templates of modules this is good because, as you'll see, one of the key things that we're trying to get at is a rapid application design environment. And we need to build templates. And to be able to do this really quickly, we need to create re reusable learning objects. And as you'll see, this is part of our process. So basically, in a nutshell, this is sort of the amalgamation of everything I've been telling you about. It needs analysis, instructional design, development and production, distribution, I'll get into each one more. Learner support and administration and measurement. Okay. Now this next slide is going to scare you probably. <laughs> but this is, this is basically what it looks like when you blow it all out. Okay. And I just wanted to show you, not, and please don't try to read, but where's my cursor? Basically we're going through a flow, something like this. Okay. And that's the flow that I want you to keep in mind as I go through all the pieces here. Okay? And there are different levels at which you can approach this flow. You can take it from a very high level. Or for a particular piece that needs to be done in two weeks, you can bypass or, or just touch on the steps and do it very quickly. It's all in how it's done. In terms of needs analysis, this is really critical to us. As Malcolm mentioned, everything we do centers around performance. Um, our objective is to improve performance, human performance. So the first thing that we require is a needs analysis. And we have a relationship management team. And even though things are not very clear right now because of the ch some changes, internal changes we're going through, their role is to do the high level needs analysis with the client and find out, okay, what exactly is it that you need? From that, we develop performance objectives. What is it that people are actually expected to do? Which is very important. Then, we perform a performance-based analysis, right here. And between those two, we come up with a performance gap. Pretty, pretty standard. The interesting thing, though, is a lot of times we get requests coming in from our clients saying, um, I need a course on motivation. My people look not too happy and I think they need to be motivated. And traditionally in, a, in, in our old world, it would be sure, we'll go look, find the best motivational course and throw it over the fence. And we've taken a stand that says that's not good enough anymore. We actually feel that we have a role in actually looking at the cost because a lot of times, um, we find that performance is affected not just by learning, not just by skills, but also by things like environment, things like um, rewards and recognition, et cetera. So we actually take time to do a causal analysis and isolate the pieces around the skills gap, the skills and knowledge gap. That becomes our area, but then we take the liberty to try to influence the organization to deal with the other pieces because we could have the best strategy, the best training product in the world. We could have an award-winning winning, CD-ROM, but it's not going to do anybody any good if the people in the branches uh, are not given the time to learn, for instance. 
from the, from the causal analysis, once we identify the skills gap, we look at our audience and then we come up with our task analysis. We actually look and go and assess exactly what, what people are expected to do. From that, we move into the instructional design component. Learning goals, we do an instructional analysis, come up with learning objectives, validate it through our user testing, then we come up with an overall content map. And from that map, we come to something that we call an integrated learning component architecture. And that is the high level plan for everything that we're going to do. From that comp component architecture, it basically has elements around discrete learning and embedded learning, and I'll touch on that a little bit. And then we start making decisions. Do we build this or do we outsource it? What makes sense? Okay. In terms of embedded learning, we basically deal with two kinds of embedded learning. In intrinsic EPSS, which as you may be aware, stands for Electronic Performance Support Systems, or extrinsic, okay? Intrinsic meaning, basically what the philosophy around electronic performance support systems is that we take the skills and knowledge that the individual requires in their job and we embed it into the tools, okay? So if we're dealing with an application, a new application for instance, we can embed wizards. I'm sure you're all familiar with wizards and those types of um, embedded learning. We can embed in the application at the design stage with the system developers. That's the ideal, that's in the ideal world. And if we're, if we're called early enough, we can actually work side by side with developers to do this. If we're called in later on in the process, for instance, there's a new application and they're at the prototype stage, then we don't have that luxury of going back and, and uh, influence in the design. So we have to then look at extrinsic EPSS. There are tools out there like RoboHelp and um, other help support systems that can be attached and layered on top of an application that again allows to put skills, advice, and knowledge into the tools and basically have it as part of the workflow of the individual. They don't have to leave their work. That's why it's called embedded. They can do it as they're working. They can learn and take what they need when they need it in the context of their work. This is ideal and we're moving more and more towards this direction. The screen learning is more traditional and we look at the design and production of customized discrete learning components. Basically our output, as I think Malcolm already pointed out, print-based self-study, intranet, internet self-study, interactive multimedia and CD-ROMs, we also have a facilitated side in the classroom. But the interesting thing here too is we're moving more and more in creating the reusable learning objects, templates as well, again, to get this rapid application going so we can reuse and not reinvent the wheel every time, measurement components, and this whole thing becomes an iterative process. And we're building the infrastructure to allow us to do that. Okay, this reusable learning objects then Go into our distribution. Oh, sorry, but I meant there's another slide around outsourcing. We could take the same thing and find vendors and have them do it for us or in partnership with us. In terms of distribution, before, four years ago, we were strictly in physical delivery systems. So things like print base in a classroom, even CD ROMs. We were mailing hundreds of CD ROMs to branches. More and more, we're moving towards electronic delivery systems for obvious reasons in terms of cost and speed. We're looking at internet, internet, uh, video conference, and we're starting to look more and more at push-pull media. Um, in case someone is not familiar with push-pull media, um, an application like Pointcast, for instance, in a computer is a good example um, of, of that, or web TV. Okay. We also have a learner support infrastructure. For everything that we do, we gotta provide support for our learners, for them to call to ask us questions, as well as we have tracking of learning progress. So that involves a lot of technology, databases in our applications, et cetera. And also, we do measurement studies. We actually go into the branches and take a variety of different approaches 
ranging from surveys to ethnographic, longitudinal studies in the branches, to assess learning as it happens in the workplace, not just, um, we're not comfortable, we don't think it's good enough just to give a test and have the, re the score reflect what the person has learned. Because what we're interested in is performance. So we actually take the time to go and assess the performance where it's happening. Then we take that information from this, combined with learner evaluation and feedback, as well as our client feedback, and we feed it back to the beginning, back to establishing what the current performance gap, how much did we close it, is it still there, and then we move through the next iteration. Now, it sounds very laborious, but it really isn't. Um, it's, it can be done fairly quickly, and we find that it's starting to work for us. It's not perfect, but it's working. And that's it for me. Um, you heard from Malcolm and from Eduardo, some of the people in the process side of our, our equation. I was going to focus more on the technologies and some of the delivery channels that we get all this stuff out for, by. Uh, these are the five key points of access for most of our e-learning. We have a slew of branch-based multimedia PCs, and actually it's what we call the learning PC network. We have a mobile workforce, which is in excess of 1,100 by the time we finish off this month, of users who have multimedia laptops that are fully connected back to the bank and into the Institute for Learning. We have learning centers, which are sites that are owned by our clients, but which we interact with as, as content providers and providers of learning management. Um, the office towers, uh, either on a standalone basis or on a network basis, can subscribe to our services through either integrated networks, through the wider network, or local networks. And then home users. The access to all of our learning is paramount. And by design, we include home use into all of our learning tools. So any CD-ROM, any portable media that we, that we uh, push out is, is available to our, our users to take home. And I'll discuss some challenges with that. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the learning PCs, we have about 450 plus, and they are growing as we roll out this network. They're Windows 95 Pentium multimedia uh, machines. They're pretty s standard fare these days, but this project started about two years ago. And this was a very significant investment for our clients but um, they, they accepted it and they, they went ahead with it. And we actually networked this into the branch LAN environment, which is OS2 based. So we are the first Windows implementation of any technology into the branch environment. That was, uh, pretty, it was a pretty in in interesting fight. But it was something that the, that, that the client sort of agreed that it was the best alternative and makes our, our platform a lot more robust than we would have. We are fully networked into the OS2, OS2 environment. And uh, as a result, we're able to leverage all the, all the investments that the client and the organization has made into this environment. Things such as systems management, the actual delivery vehicles, uh, things like backup print repositories. These are all e extremely cost, high cost items. And we didn't have to duplicate any of this exercise because we were able to leverage what was already there. Um, on this environment, the content team delivery is electronic. This is not an IP-based network. It's a production environment. So when you walk into the Bank of Montreal branch and you do a query on your account or you process your mortgage or you, or, or you apply for a loan, that same network houses our learning PCs. Um, so while it's not IP-based, it is quite robust. Um, for We have a threshold over which we take our content and put it onto CD-ROM. And we're very much moving into the area of hybrid application development. So we take our, our high content pieces, put them onto you know, discrete media pieces like CD-ROMs, but still have the interactivity over the, the network for a lot of the change items. The mobile laptops, there are about 1,100 of them. And they're, again, increasing in, uh, in population. Uh, they're connected back to us through a virtual private network, back into our internet. And they also have full internet access. Uh, people can access our network basically from anywhere, from a client's house, from their own homes, from their workplace, out on the road. As long as they can get into a phone line, they can come back into the Bank of Montreal. The Institute for Learning 
And for a variety of reasons, we were in a position uniquely within the, the, uh, the, the enterprise that we provided some of the key components and uh, things like the you know, domain name services and the web gateways are hosted at the Institute for a production environment. So we're very close to the production uh, pipelines and we're able to take our content and integrate it right onto you know, the in desktop with minimal uh, sort of so wear and tear on, on our network. These units are centrally managed, so again, they're very cost effective from that perspective. And b because they're IP based, they can take advantage uh, in real time to any of the you know, electronic delivery, the web-based content. They have full CD-ROM access. In addition, when we gave these units, these 1,100 users, a majority of them did not have any technical skills. These people had never really touched a computer before, or if they had, it was in a very controlled environment. So we provided them with an actual videotape that showed them how to set up their laptop, how to connect it, and how to do the basic functionality pieces prior to actually turning the laptop on. And there's a text module which outlines page by page, screenshot by screenshot, what they should be doing to getting their email, to like all the productivity services, how to access any of the, the sort of value added services on the, on the laptop. So it's a very safe environment for them. Our learning centers are locally managed and again, they are locally networked to take advantage of certain key, you know, like print resources and, and media storage and that sort of stuff. They are, they subscribe to both enterprise content, so such as like, you know, the basic uh, uh, service content, like sort of um, how to do the basic Bank of Montreal type of you know, like behaviors. At the same time, they allow the flexibility for regional content. So for example, in the Quebec division, they can put local content or regional content and have, a, have their own flavor. So they don't just become one learning center across the board, they are able to be customized and adapted to whatever the learner's needs are. They have full internet capability because that's a very easy thing to do these days. But on the internet side, we do have challenges. The, the, the cost of a internet extension to some of these locations is quite prohibitive. But as the enterprise is growing in its internet, internet uh, sort of uh, capabilities, they will be they will be connected. Again, a variety of content and deliveries, CD-ROM, video, text, and some of them even subscribe to old type of like small work, small group learning workshops and they're changeable as the, as the needs grow. The office towers, um, the biggest challenge here, while they have access to a network for email and that sort of stuff, the PCs tend to be in, in age from five months down to like four or five years. So the multimedia capabilities of these PCs are quite limited, and that presents a challenge. Internet access, we have currently in excess of 50% of our office tower population accessing the internet by the end of this year, and the goal is by the year 2000 to have the entire enterprise to be internet connected. So that presents us a lot of opportunities. Content delivery varies all the way from traditional CBT on diskette to local network based deliveries to CD-ROM to text and a whole variety of things. We, have, we haven't talked about things like video conferencing back into the institute or external partners, but it all exists out there. For home users, if you got a PC at home, you can take advantage of our stuff. Now, that's an easy thing to say, but it's quite a significant challenge you know, to take a, take a CD-ROM, which was you know, developed for an IBM platform, and to give it to a user who may have a clone that's of indeterminate age and has you know, distinct components. We try and help our users. All We do a significant amount of testing within the QA process on multiple platforms to try and take advantage of standards. We provide users with all of the content that they'll need to standardize their laptops or, mobile or their home computers. Um, but you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a significant challenge. We have limited or no connectivity to try and you know, do any sort of electronic distribution. We have very limited management capability. So again, we, we rely on our users, of, you know, on a, on a very informed user base to make this a success. A uh, significant challenge here also is maintaining security. A lot of our, our learning tools are bank proprietary. The knowledge is sensitive to the bank from a competitive and a security basis. So to maintain that environment out in the user's home or out in the field is a very interesting challenge and we work with a lot of partners within the IT organization 
to try and to try and ensure that. Support, as Eduardo and Malcolm mentioned, we have a support infrastructure which provides pretty much you know, 724 support services for our clients, either within the institute or within our partners uh, in the IT organization or external vendors. Uh, content delivery here can vary on the electronic side from it, like in dialogue networks to the virtual private network and to CD-ROM, diskette, text, and video. I was going to show you, um, I need to apologize in advance. I, we weren't able to take all of our internet content and bring it here. So I've taken screenshots of some key components and just give you a flavor of where we're going with some stuff. This is the, inf the, uh, the Institute for Learning, that's what the IFL is, the Institute for Learning's uh, main site. This is very different in design and in feel from some of the other internet sites that the bank has. There, the main intent here is to try and preserve the, the environment and the culture that exists within the institute. So as you see, very, very you know, safe and warm type of like graphics. Uh, we focus on four key areas, one being the news and the other one, you know, which talks about things like you know, what's happening at the institute, new course announcements. We provide actual recipes from our dining hall to our users because a lot of people give us requests, so we figured, hey, why not? You know, so if you want to know how to make tiramisu, come to our website. Um, we talk about what's, what's, who's new at the institute because we take a lot of our faculty comes from the field and they come in, they're seconded on a limited basis or on a you know, time sensitive basis, so therefore you know, people know some people at the institute and they want to, you know, they want to hook up with them you know, either prior to or after their course. The second area is about the IFL. Because we have 35,000 employees, we try and make sure that everybody gets a sense of what the IFL is, why it's there, what it feels like, and you know, what, it, what, what really the mission is of the IFL. So we try and give a virtual tour of the IFL. We introduce people to the different departments that are within the Institute because, again, it's, it's not a huge place in terms of people, but we play a significant portion, a significant, uh, we're significant players in, in their lives within the bank and we interact with them a lot more often than most people think. Um, then we bring them to a site which is called learn at ifl.net. This is the portal to the electronic classroom. And the electronic classroom is basically a virtual learning environment used to facilitate the distributed delivery of IFL courses and learning events. What that means for us is we basically take some content that really doesn't require people to be at the institute. So say other technical courses, or courses that are very foundational that don't really take advantage of the interperson or the interactivity within a classroom setting, and we can move that out into people's workplaces. Plus, giving them advantages of having less you know, disruptions either on their work life or on their home life. So, one of the key about um, almost three years ago, we had our first electronic classroom, and this is what it looked like. It wasn't web-based, it wasn't internet-based, nothing of that type. It was a simple dial-up solution. We sent out laptops to a lot of users, and these laptops over a dial-up network, we provided 800 numbers, so they could call in from anywhere. They called in to the institute on a, to a dial-up server, and they were able to, to have their course presented to them electronically. We set up uh, an email environment where people could talk to each other with, with email. We paired people from different areas of, of the country, so you had a partner from Vancouver and a partner from St. John's. Um, we had people from Harris Bank in the US. We had people from Hong Kong, all part of the course. And they all interacted in groups. And they all you know, did the same types of you know, discussion groups and same type of teamwork that they did in a regular classroom. This was a regular course. It was a, in a credit skills course, a foundational credit skills course. So if you wanted to be a lender, you had to take this course and pass it. We took all the content of this course, put it into an electronic medium. It was a facilitated course. So at regular times, people could call up to a facilitator. They, and the tests were identical to the ones that we gave in the classroom. Uh, and you could, look, you, you could pass assignments back and forth to the instructor and, and get any sort of uh, facilitation that you'd get in the classroom on timed intervals. At the end of this course, uh, we found that it was an extremely successful sort of uh, endeavor because the cost of the course was recovered in a matter of about eight months. But more importantly, the score, the, the results of the participants, the actual scores were identical and the spectrum was identical to what we found in the classroom. 
So people were very comfortable taking it. And one of the users who took this course uh, was a repeat user. And why she hadn't done so well the first time is because she found that she was very inhibited in, in, in speaking up within a classroom environment. So because the skill levels varied and she wasn't a very strong candidate at that time, she felt afraid in asking questions. But in this environment, she was one of the top performers because she was able to use her time whenever she wanted with very little you know, disruption to her life, and she excelled. So you know, taking all those, all those success stories and having access to newer technologies, newer networks, we migrated the electronic classroom onto our internet site, and currently we have two offerings that are totally electronic on our internet. One being a trade finance course, which uh, is a comprehensive workshop that examines the fundamentals of trade finance theory, practice, and products. And an another one, and these, these, these two courses are available to anybody in general in the Bank of Montreal C community. Another course on effective writing. So this is a facilitated course again on effective writing. You sign up electronically, you take the course electronically, and you graduate electronically. Um, the last part of our, of our website is a area called LAPS, which stands for the Learning Administration and Planning System, where you can actually check the course catalog. You can register electronically. You can take a look at your progress, your learning history within, within the bank. And you can also, there's a new area on project management, which Malcolm talked about. That's going to be the, the entry point into your project management career. Uh, another. I, I, I referred to the mobile computing workforce that's out there. We actually host the mobile computing site, and this is not, right now it's called mobile computing, but you can, you can expand this into anybody who's accessing the bank from outside or internally going outside you know, onto the internet. Now again, these were users who had a very limited technology background. They're very uncomfortable with the technology. And when they talked about things like the internet and, and, the, and the internet, it was a total washout. They, they had no reference points here. We, uh, we provide them five basic things on, on the website. We provide them access to the legacy application, so the exact, the exact same application that, that they have available in, in the branch environment, the 3270 type applications. We give them access to those. And again, we haven't really started, you know, this is an opportunity for us to implement EPSS right into the system. So they get an environment like this. This is provided by one of our, our vendors. <laughs> and uh, you know, basically, it just says, this is by design. It just says 3270, MAS, and that sort of thing. So you know, for users, they really don't have any reference points here. They, they don't really feel comfortable. We'll be putting some, EP, some EPSS solutions on there to try and guide them into the right places at the right times. Um, on, and then they have an option to explore the internet. Now, these people have never used the internet. They've heard about a lot of it. And so we just tell them, basically, OK, you want to search the internet. So we have a button to search the internet. They go to a page after this. That's, that shows them a, a typical search pattern and what they should be putting in and how they should be searching and what search engines mean. Uh, we give them a lot of learning links. So these are links that are public domain that people have put up that, that basically show people what the internet community looks like and what the internet really means. Now, again, we manage these links on a regular basis to make sure that they don't go null after a while. We give them a lot of business links, so links either internal to the bank or outside that are of pertinent, uh, of pertinent to them. And we, we cover over things like, how do I explore the internet and what it means? So like some of the foundational philosophies behind the internet. We give them a guided tour of uh, resources on the bank's own internal environment such as all of our partner companies, or, or the, the Bank of Montreal group of companies, to MBanks, to Nesbitt Burns, Bank Omer, so, and all the resources that are available on, on each site. Um, one of the biggest hits on, on the site also are a series of job aids that we provide for our users. These are like, for example, these people have Lotus Notes Mail. And Notes Mail requires some configuration and so on, and these, and we, these people are very hesitant in changing anything. So we actually give them screenshots of a process step by step by step. They can, they can, they can click on the, little, on, the, on the thumbnail pictures and it shows them what they should be expecting and therefore it gives them a very safe environment in which to do their work and anything that's expected of them. So how do we do it? That's very simple from our perspective. We always emphasize, the emphasis is always on a managed solution. 
if we don't look at a managed solution, either from a systems perspective or from a process perspective, it's very expensive and isn't very palatable from our client side. Uh, we involved the IT group from the beginning. Uh, we're part of the IT planning process in the, in the bank. We, in fact, have IT staff resident at the institute. So there's the network group and the advanced applications group. They're actually resident at, within the IFL because it's a partnership between us and them to try and make the IFL not only a place of learning but a showcase for the integration of technology, processes, people. And uh, we, as Malcolm said, play a key role, one of our key, key mandates is to influence the right people, the right processes, the right organizational structures. So for example, uh, a, a few of us are on things like the architecture, architecture Review Board, which looks at architecture investments in the enterprise. So that seems to help quite a bit. Um, we, again, leverage client investments. The technology investments now are in the billions of dollars. And it's not prudent for us to discount any investments, whether they're progressive or not. So we, we, as much as we can, we leverage what's already out there. And the development for us is very evolutionary. So for example, some of the products I'll show you existed in paper-based form. And the evolution to a electronic medium is very justified and very proper. And because we partner with the IT folks at the table, the client always hears one solution. There is no argument at the table that my mind is better than yours and so on and so on. We have one voice because we've already done our homework prior to that. And it, it's a very good relationship. I'm not, and don't, um, don't understand that it's a very, very rosy picture. We have our battles, we have our, our disagreements, but in the end, either they'll educate us or we educate our counterparts in the organization, and in the end, we come out much better for, for the discussion. In the development phase, we try and duplicate the, the production environment wherever possible. So if we're working with a system, we're working with an artifact, we'll duplicate it within the institute or at our, at our vendor location. And if we can't, for example, it's been, you know, we tried to move an IBM mainframe, it's very hard, but so in that case, we'll go and sit on the raised floor, and we'll do our development over there. Um, all the tools that we use, all the multimedia tools, the systems tools, are compliant with enterprise standards or project standards. If they're new, they get incorporated into the tool set of the, of the enterprise, so that from a support perspective and from a maintenance perspective, they are cost effective. We go through the exact same quality assurance process as any production delivery. So if we, uh, for example, we are doing a new mortgage application, the quality assurance process is the exact same for that as, as for any one of our deliveries. We are represented at all operational forums for, for the life of the project. So we don't escape any scrutiny at, at, at any point, and we're able to give our input into the process at all, at all levels. After the, project's out, after, after the implementation is done, we provide support for all of our deliveries, uh, not only from a content perspective, but from a technology perspective. The platforms that we run on, the learning PC platform, we are just as responsible for that as the IT folks. And the partnership is very crucial to make sure that we get the right handoffs. We integrate into the enterprise problem management solution so that we add into the problem management database so that the, the learning is continued throughout the organization. The support analyst at the, at the institute works alongside the, uh, the actual development team so that he or she understands what the problems are and what was used to develop, so therefore the, the you know, turnaround times are much faster. And the whole, the whole team adds continuously to our own knowledge bank. And we share this with our partners within the organization and outside. And you know, I, 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 I'm very sincere about this idea of shared pain. The you know, development team sometimes learns quite uh, painful, painful you know, lessons by talking to, to some of the support people saying, you know what, you guys put this out there, it was a great thing to use, but it's causing a hell of a problem supporting. So next time, we'll do it better. At the same time, the development people educate the support people to try and say, okay, you know what, you can talk to the user in a different perspective. And that makes the conversation a lot more easier to manage. Some of the stuff we're doing in the future, as our networks expand, we're able to offer um, much more you know, richer, in deliveries. Um, one of the biggest problems we have is that the browsers that are used within the organization vary from you know, 
Netscape version 2 all the way to version 4 of, bo of both browsers. That presents us a lot of problems in looking at things like, like in a Java or you know, looking at the SGML side of the world. We're hoping that's going to be a new opportunity for us. Uh, software agents. We're within the IFL pioneering some work within the banking community that looks at software agents. The problem for us in, in this arena is that we don't have the content presence out in the environment nor the, net, nor the networks. But as soon as that problem gets solved, we'll be out there with, a, with, a, with an offer. Some of the enhanced interfaces, looking at voice, looking at some of the neural nets, because we have a significant portion of the bank which would appreciate offerings of this type and uh, would make our products a lot more uh, functional. Knowledge management frameworks, and in particular communities of interest. We're doing some work around here, and a lot of the, the conversations around knowledge management are on the IT side, things like you know, data mining activities and so on. But knowledge management represents a much bigger opportunity for the organization. And for us at the Institute, we're, able to, we're in a very, very uh, auspicious location that we can bring together the technology, the human factor side, and also the, the, the organizational side of the bank to put together a framework that truly harnesses the knowledge capital of, of the bank. Um, for e-commerce, this is an area that we're just going into. And Don and I were just talking about this, some of the technology opportunities to, try, to, to start putting e-commerce into a, into a mindset that it, that it becomes a product offering for the bank. Um, this is a very unclear area, but we have some key partnerships with some people like IBM and the academic side of the world that makes e-commerce a, a, a word that's more regularly used within the bank's environment. I was going to show you, I'll show you a couple of things. Um, we have some production deliveries. And why they're significant is that these, these artifacts were paper-based up till about, uh, well, some of them still are, but up to about six months ago, they were all paper-based. The first thing I'm gonna, I'll, I'll show you is a tool called Learning for Success. And while le why Learning for Success is, a, is an important thing for us is that it's the core learning system for all of our branches. So every individual that's within the branch environment and even outside uses Learning for Success as a, as a tool for learning and <coughs> certification and for career development. Learning for Success currently is 120 modules that are all paper-based and they sit within the branch and people access them. Just like as you have policies and procedures and that type of thing, actually it's, it's supplemented policies and procedures so that people are using Learning for Success as their, as their tool for everything pretty much. Uh, a couple of key things for us are to try and keep some of the design of uh, intranet-based objects very similar so, that the, so that, that the user doesn't have to go through too much work to get to where they want to be. Uh, Learning for Success has an operations focus, it has a human resources focus, it has a sales and service focus, and a leadership and change focus. I'll just go into one, one area here. And if this, is an, it, this now becomes a delivery that used to be shelf-based. It was on a shelf in the branch that people had to go and, make advantage, and take advantage of. And now this, this will be accessible over the bank's intranet right onto the desktops where they're working. And they'll be able to use it to do not only their learning, but a lot of their work uh, in a real-time basis. So for example, if you want to know how to manage a safety deposit box, it'll tell you, you know, how to do that process. And not only to do, that, to do the process, but it'll also certify you along the way that you have accomplished that knowledge task. And it, this allows you to move forward in your career development plan from one job class to, 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 to another. Um, the key point to notice here is the, the design of, of this artifact is we try to be as consistent amongst all of our offerings as we can. So for example, to have the toolbar on top, there was, a, you know, there was an agreement made within, within, the, within the IFL's development community to standardize on the, on the toolbar and to have the left-hand menu bar there. Um, if, you, if I show you another artifact, I'm sorry I have to change CDs here. If I go to a, this is a second you know, delivery called service and maintenance. This actually looks after the actual financial system that, that exists within the branch. And this is, a, tool, this is a, a learning tool on how to use that system. 
So we talk about same, we, we provide a toolbar at the top and a, and a menu bar on the, on the left. We talk about, and we try to be very, very human where, where possible. And we give people scenarios, and for example, if you want to change the limit on, a, on, a, on, a, on your first bank card, for those of you who are Bank of Montreal customers, your first bank card is your machine, the card that you use in the instant bank machine. But the application as it comes up, this is a real shot of the application. And this application using JavaScript, I can't show you here, but um, using JavaScript, it, it, it emulates the actual system environment. So the system is emulated in a very safe manner. You know, the, the, the learner feels very secure and is able to practice before actually moving out onto the real system. So we provide a very, very safe simulation-based based environment. And if I show you, third application. Great. Again, one other thing to notice is that all of our application deliveries are in English and French. That's a significant development issue and requires a set of competencies that we have to keep in mind when we're taking on any new work. Again, very similar type of make. Now, the reason this one is different is because the user community demanded a little bit different design from us. And they didn't want a toolbar on the left-hand side because their screen space is limited. So the amount of real estate that we can live on is, is a little bit limited. So this has to exist in, in this manner. Uh, but very similar types of artifacts on there, like you know the flows, the scenarios, the hints and tips. Uh, if I take a look at how to set up a, you know, a, a registered fund for user, I actually have, again, a simulation-based environment where somebody can practice before going out onto a live system. It's a very safe environment for, for people to use. Um, this, this is where we're going with, with the web, uh, some of the artifacts on the web. What you'll notice there is that with the, these things don't take advantage of, um, of a lot of multimedia, a lot of, interact, a lot of interactivity other than what's available on the internet right now. Uh, our environment and most environments, I really haven't come, out, come across any environments in the corporate world outside of either the, uh, the technology side or on smaller environments where true, true interactivity is possible over large networks. Like we have 1,100 branches and it's very significant effort to put true interactivity everywhere. So a lot of our stuff still goes out on things like CD-ROM. Uh, one of these items which is, is a tool called the Quest. And this is a, uh, a CD that focuses on selling skills. And Eduardo actually was the, uh, was the project manager for this course, for this, for the, for the, for the, sorry, for this endeavor. And it was commissioned on behalf of the client to you know, deliver s uh, selling skills training across the organization. I'll just go through it. You can ask me questions about it afterwards. Uh, this is the, uh, the CD that Malcolm uh, was talking about. Recently, it won uh, first place at the British Interactive Multimedia, Multimedia Association for uh, corporate internal training. So we were up against British Airways, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, Lloyds Bank, and a host of other institutions. And uh, you know, I think we have a quality piece here. Okay. Again, you know, it's a very simple interface, not too, not, not too complicated, and once, and it tries to be. What is the activity you would like to go to next? It tries to be as, I guess, human as possible. Hi. I hope you can help me. I am wanting to invest for my retirement, but I'm not much of an investor. I hear that RRSPs are good, good. but you know, I want my five not long to lunch now. To go a long way, <laughs> but mutual fund may not give me the security I need to buy that. Wanna, 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 wanna. But I also intend to contribute three hundred dollars a week. Plus, did I lock my car this morning? Hmm. So, what's the best way to make this happen?
scary, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's amazing what you can miss when you're not really listening. But you know how it is. Your mind wanders, and before you know it, you're lost. And it's easy to do. I mean, hey, it happens to all of us. Because, you know why? We hear faster than people can talk. About 300 words a minute faster. So this gives us a lot of time to get bored and think about other stuff, like what I want to have for lunch, for example. Now, this isn't good when you work in a bank, because you spend 65 to 75% of your time talking with your customers. So there's a lot of opportunity for miscommunication. Just remember, listening is our greatest asset, so it's worth doing it right. Now, click continue to listen to what you just missed. Uh, this another good thing. the activity you would like to... So it's very simple, it's simple interface. Have you ever associated paraphrasing with listening? It may sound odd. But watch this customer interaction and decide for yourself. I have a real problem with my bank statement. You people are charging me way too much for my withdrawals. I work hard, you know, and you have the nerve to pull a fast one? I'm not stupid. You think you can get away with this? You think I wouldn't notice? Whoa, we got a hot situation here, huh? It's easy to stop listening because you're already trying to come up with an explanation. It's like when you're a kid, always trying to come up with excuses when you did something wrong. I don't know about you, but it really worked for me. Anyway, it's important to show your customer you're listening and to confirm what he is saying by paraphrasing. Let's see what happens. If I understand you correctly, you think the bank is overcharging you for services you normally receive. Oh, you've got that right. Let's have a look. What kind of account do you have? Checking. Have you been writing any extra checks lately? No. So... So you've been using your account the same way you normally do, is that right? Yes. Well, now that I think of it, I've wired money to my daughter a couple times. She's in Europe. Did you hear that? Our financial services manager paraphrased her customer's comments to confirm the facts without giving an opinion. So, she received some very useful information. Okay, well that explains it, Mr. Simmons. You see that this charge is for transfers, not for regular services. Oh, I see. I thought it was unlike the bank to change its rates without telling me. Um, thanks again, Andrea, for clearing that up. No problem. Paraphrasing helped our financial services manager show she was involved and caring in her listening. She spoke calmly and professionally, so the customer cooled down and left satisfied. Now, it's your turn to try paraphrasing. Now again, all this content, you can read about it in pretty much every textbook out there. They're very, very good speakers who speak about these type of things. But why this was so, so effective, that we have user groups, and every single time we brought a user group in, they identified with the situation, they identified with the customer, they identified with the emotions that ran there, and it basically made, made it more real to them. Now it's time to demonstrate that you are listening. Remember, good paraphrasing involves listening for the facts and confirming them without giving an opinion. Hi, I need a new MasterCard because the one I have is too expensive and doesn't have any of the benefits. And I hear that you guys have all kinds of different ones now. My friend Gina, she told me about this one that um, helps you buy a car or something, which I think is really cool because she really, really needs one. And um, this. There's a, there's a frequent flyer card, right? Because um, I travel a lot, but I really need it because I sell computers. Uh, do you guys need any computers? Because like, if you're in a big sale right now, I can help you get a really good deal. But, um, anyway, um, also, uh, there's one that um, covers uh, insurance. Will that help me? I think she's from Traders, you were saying, right? Yeah. So after you finish this off, you're, you're supposed to practice exactly what you learned. Try to paraphrase what learned. this customer just communicated to you. Click on one phrase each for the beginning, middle, and end of your sentence. When you are satisfied with the sentence, click on the Done button to listen to your complete reply and to see how the customer responds. 
So now if I've done my, my homework, I can choose saying you sound confused. You sound confused, but I think your friend Gina needs a car loan and you want to travel more. You sound confused, but I think your friend Gina needs a car loan and you want to travel more. Well, that's not exactly what I meant. Okay, let me explain it to you again. Psst. Remember, focus on the important details and avoid adding any personal opinion. Go on, try it again. Come on, you can do it. Try to paraphrase what this customer just communicated to you. Click on one phrase each for the beginning, middle, and end of your sentence. When you are satisfied with the sentence, So you are looking for a less expensive master, and you are interested in air. So do you mean to say you are looking for a less expensive Mastercard, and you are interested in air miles points as well as insurance? Yes, that's exactly it. How did you know? <laughs> Great work! You captured the essence of the conversation and identified her needs right away without offering her opinion. I hope that gives you a flavor. Well, this is, again, something that people can practice within a safe environment. They don't have to be afraid of asking questions, of making mistakes. They can go over and over and, and you know, learn until they're actually proficient in what they wanted to do. Um, this is too robust to pass over most networks. So right now it's available in interactive form. But we are working with certain key vendors from, from like Bell and so on to try and put this over some proposed structures that the organization is currently looking at.